Goods, called that. Uh, okay, so uh, today we're talking about, um, I guess, you know, about the tools. So this uh, came from physics, um, primarily, I would say. So I thought it's, it's a good idea to um, step back and look at uh, physical motivation also a little bit as uh, it was suggested uh, to Dirac. And then, uh, and then we look at the mathematics of it, which uh, was not done by Dirac, it was done by Atia Singer and other people. So uh, first of all, this is the uh, Dirac equation. So, um, so when, when Dirac started thinking about this, so this is Dirac equation for electron. So this is, it goes back to 1927. So he wrote a very famous paper, became very famous, substantial paper in 1927. And uh, before this paper, so there were basically two equations in quantum mechanics um, for electron. So the first equation was Schrodinger's equation. So this equation, as you know, is of this form I H bar. Uh, d psi dt equal to a psi. So uh, h bar, of course, is a constant of nature. It's Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Uh, so here psi, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's the wave function of the electron, and h is the Hamiltonian. is equal to P2. So I just write operators uh, in quantum mechanics without hat. Usually people write P with hat or capital P to distinguish them uh, from the classical momentum operators, but I don't do that. I just write P and we understand this is an operator. P2 over 2M plus B, where in this case, uh, P is I H bar the gradient operator. So if you calculate P2, you get uh, minus H bar square uh, Laplacian. So this Laplacian, of course, is um, the, the, the usual Laplacian, uh, namely uh, is. Uh, d dx d2 dx2 plus d2 dy2 plus d2 is a 2 with positive sign and then minus it makes it a uh, positive definite type of positive operator. So but for me Laplacian today is going to be uh, this one. Okay and m is the mass of this uh, particle. So, for example, if it's electron, then this is mass of the electron. And this B is um, the, the potential that this particle is moving uh, inside, inside that potential. B is the potential function. So this uh, Schrodinger equation uh, has been very, very successful in dealing with uh, uh, electron. I mean, uh, for example, for uh, atoms with uh, one electron, hydrogen atom or hydrogen type atoms, uh, 
uh, this is a prediction. Uh, you can solve this, find eigenvalues, eigenfunctions, and then it gives uh, the correct experimental values for energy levels of uh, hydrogen atoms. Actually, all other atoms. So this uh, is very, very, very good uh, equation. But uh, the defect of this equation that uh, Dirac uh, pointed out is that this equation is not relativistic about it. So that's, uh, so it's, it's an amazing equation. It's, it's, it's beginning of quantum mechanics. It's really what defines quantum mechanics. Uh, but uh, this equation is not uh, <laughs> relativistic about it. So uh, Schrodinger equation is not a relativistic invariant. So I will I will mention what we mean exactly by not being relativistic invariant soon. But let's just keep that in mind. But then uh, at that time, there was another equation which was relativistic invariant. So there was an equation which was relativistic invariant, and that equation was Klein Gordon equation. Uh, so, um, so the Klein Gordon equation, another famous equation of physics, quantum mechanics, Klein Gordon equation. Incidentally, Klein Gordon was also discovered by Schrödinger. Um, Schrödinger had that equation also in his writings, but then he favored uh, this equation better. Um, he favored the non-relativistic equation, uh, but he had the relativistic equation first, actually. Anyhow, so this is Klein Gordon equation, which is this equation uh, d two d d squared minus uh, this Laplacian uh, plus uh, M2 of psi. So this equation we can write it as box of psi plus M2 of psi equal to two. So uh, M again is mass of the particle over there. And uh, so in this case, the psi now is a function from R4, from space time, Minkowski space time, to R or C. I mean, so this is a scalar field. It could be a real scalar field, or it could be complex scalar field, but this is a scalar field. And here also, of course, psi uh, is uh, something from um, psi is members from R3, for example. Okay, so one particle moving in a space, psi is from R3 to C. For Schrodinger, it's, it's absolutely important that this equation is complex value. I mean, you should allow complex uh, values inside this uh, equation. Otherwise, you run into it. If you just say that my uh, fields, I mean, the kind of wave functions are real valued, you run into trouble. Uh, you cannot do quantum mechanics with just real numbers, as far as I know. It's just, uh, you run into difficulty. So, by the way, again, historical notes, Schrodinger at first had a real value wave function. And only later on he realized that he had to incorporate complex values. So of course it, it looks strange, right? Because at that time, imagine, I mean, what is the mean, physical meaning of this wave function? I mean, it was not very clear what this complex wave physically really means. I mean, a particle means something physically at least, approximation of real particle, but what is this? I mean. So anyhow, so in this case, uh, this is a scalar field. Uh, so now this equation, uh, so prime order equation, so this is Kg. So uh, Kg is relativistically invariant. 
this thing. Uh, so let me explain this just a bit, uh, just what we mean by this relativistic invariance, in case some of you, I think you know it, but just uh, uh, refresh uh, our memory about the meaning of this, and then we'll see why this is not relativistic invariant. So what do we mean by relativistic invariant? So there is a group, uh, which is Lorentz group, L, uh, so just Lorentz group uh, of uh, special relativity, OSR. So what is it? This is the group of all uh, linear maps of Minkowski space to itself that preserves the Minkowski metric. So this is, uh, so an element here is a map from R4 to R4 linear. So it's, it's a matrix. Uh, it preserves the Minkowski metric. Preserves the Minkowski metric. Uh, so this Minkowski metric G. Um, so. We have uh, different options for this G. So let's take G to be, for example, uh, this metric. Um, maybe I just erase this. We can take G to be the metric uh, um, one minus one minus one minus one zero zero. So this is a Minkowski metric. It's not positive definite, uh, but it's, it's a quadratic form. It's symmetric, non-degenerate quadratic form. Defines the geometry of Minkowski and geometry of special relativity. So that's uh, okay. Uh, so um, now, what does it mean that this uh, lambda preserve well, lambda preserves this quadratic form? It just means that uh, lambda uh, g say lambda transpose G lambda is equal to G. It's a commutational relation like that. So, um, okay, so lambda belongs to L if and only if uh, satisfies this commutational relation. So, so it's, it's, it's a generalization in some sense of the idea of orthogonal group, but for Minkowski geometry, preserving the... So, this Lorentz group, it's, it's a Lie group. So th there are several things about Lorentz group that we should know right away, and they are not difficult to establish, is that this Lorentz group L it's a six-dimensional Lie group. I mean real Lie group. Uh, it's not connected. It has four connected components uh, with um, uh, four connected components. Uh, this connected, these four connected components uh, have physical importance, uh, each of them. Uh, the one that's connected component of identity is uh, the group of Lorentz transformations that preserve the time orientation of the space and uh, space orientation. So they preserve both. So unlike the usual space that uh, Euclidean space that just have orientation, Minkowski space has also time orientation. So two times two, four components for different so I don't want to get into that, but that's just what we have to know. Another thing which is very important to remember and to, to know right away is that this group is not compact. This is non-compact. It's non-compact. That's quite substantial. This fact that uh, the group is not compact uh, makes, uh, makes things much more complicated. Uh, 
for example, its unitary representations as a result of this non-compactness are not finite dimensional, except for very trivial one. So it's uh, to, to look for unitary representation, we have to go into infinite dimensional um, representations, which are much more complicated. And then there are a lot of issues. So anyhow, so we have this group. So this group, of course, acts on R4, and then this uh, operator here, uh, we are saying that it's uh, equivalent with respect to action of this group. So then this equivalence really means this equivalence. Really means the following thing that uh, so let me call this operator uh, whatever I mean maybe p. Uh, so if you say move your wave function, if you rotate your wave function by action of the group group element, call it psi prime, apply p to it. It's like you apply p to psi, and then move it. So what does this mean? Uh, well, what is this psi prime? Well, psi prime is really lambda psi. Well, lambda psi of x is equal to psi of lambda inverse of x. That's the usual action of groups on functions. Because the group is acting on, on space, so it's also acting on functions like this. So this is for any lambda belonging to M. This uh, is relativistic invariance, meaning of relativistic invariance. In this case, for scalar fields, for uh, vector fields, for spinner fields, uh, we have to be uh, careful at defining the appropriate temperature for the distance, just like that. Um, a simple option, of course, of this uh, relativistic invariance is that if you have a solution of this wave equation, if you move it by, uh, by, by this group element lambda, that's also a solution. So the set of solutions is invariant under the action of this Lorentz group. So if you have one solution, uh, but here it really means that the equation uh, is independent of choice of frame, of uh, relativistic frames. If you have one, uh, kind of inertial frame, relativistic frame, and you change it to another frame. You write, you do physics in this frame, and you do physics in, the, in that frame. They are the same. So what really this means is that you do experiments in, in, in a train that's moving with constant speed with respect to station, and you do experiments in the station. They they are, you don't see any difference. For example, the speed of light as a result of <laughs> the same in the train and in the station. As measured by someone in, in, in the station, they, they, they measure the speed of light to be the same. They don't see any difference. So this is quite an quite a important demand on, on equations. And so this is a klein Gordon equation relativistic invariant in this sense. Now, why, why is it relativistic invariant? So, I mean, essentially because this kind of function, uh, I mean, this operator d2, d2 minus sums of the squares of differentials is quite uh, related to this one in quadratic form. This you can easily check actually using this condition, uh, this condition, uh, this, this identity easily follows. So checking relativistic environment in this case is not difficult. Of course, m squared plays no role because it's just uh, cancels uh, easily. So it's a scale uh, operator in this case. So, mm, so that's very easy to check. Now, if you look at this, this is not relativistic invariant because uh, in, in, in x, y, z, it's second order operator. But in t, it's first order operator. But this Minkowski transformations mix everything. Mix the space and time coordinates all the time. They don't, you, there's no invariant intrinsic meaning to uh, space or time. They're mixed, it can be changed. For example, the boosts, 
these uh, Lorentz transformations, the original Lorentz transformations in X and T, if you look at those formulas that Lorentz and Poincaré Einstein derived, you see that uh, X and T are mixed. This is not like classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, when you change the, the frame, uh, yeah, sure, X prime is, uh, is, is a mixture of X and T again, but T prime is T plus some R, but it's not. T prime is preserves T, time preserves its character. It's not mixed with the space for it. Anyhow, so a relativistic invariant equation cannot have second, cannot be of second order in, uh, in one variable and first order in another variable. Because these variables are on the same footing. The variables are on the same footing, so this cannot be. Okay, so this is this equation that if I borrow them. So this equation looks good. I mean, uh, it, this equation looks okay. I mean, uh, it's relativistic invariant and uh, it was proposed, but Iraq uh, said, no, I don't want this equation. And he has two reasons for rejecting the equation. Um, one reason was that it's uh, second order in time. So uh, let me write it. So I just say why Iraq does not like uh, Klein Gordon KGE. Uh, the first reason was that it's second order in time. Being second order in time means that if you want to solve the initial value problem, you have to know the value of your wave function at time zero and also the value of the speed of the wave function, so partial derivatives. You need two pieces of that. It's second order. You need the value of the wave function and you need the, uh, the value of the speed of the wave function or derivative, time derivative of the wave function at any point in space time. And, uh, but that's not the case for uh, Schrodinger's equation. In Schrodinger's equation, if you know the value of wave function at any time, you know the value of wave function at all future and past times. You have, you have a unique solution. You have a unique solution and you can write this solution. If H is time independent, easily you can write the exponential of, for example, one over IH bar T times H works, uh, you get a solution. So for this reason, I mean, okay, so whatever, I don't know, I mean, for this reason, he rejected this for himself. Okay, second reason, perhaps maybe it was more serious, uh, was that uh, this wave function psi does not have a probabilistic in interpretation. Psi, KG does not admit a probabilistic interpretation. So what do we mean? What do I mean uh, by this? In, in the case of uh, Schrodinger's equation, uh, psi itself is not, a, is not such a physical quantity. What is really important about psi is absolute value of psi squared. That's the probability distribution. And you always say that, okay, I can normalize it to norm one, then that's really a probability distribution, okay? So in this case, uh, so this is the kind of probability wave function, so psi is psi psi. And uh, because uh, this H is self-adjoint, this is preserved in time because this is a unitary flow. So the length of this vector does not change in time. So, uh, I mean, there is a time here, right? So it's time independent. So 
So what does it mean? It means that in, in Schrodinger's case, if you start with a probability distribution, which would tell you what is the probability of finding particle in this area of uh, space at this moment of time, and then you solve the equation, you find the families of wave functions, these are always, again, of probability one. So the probability wave changes in the right way. So at each moment of time, you can say, for sure, what is the probability of finding a particle in this part of the space? So, so this, is, this is very nice. This is, uh, this is due to Born. This is this Born's probabilistic inter in in interpretation of the wave function. This was a major uh, discovery of Born. And before Born, people didn't know what's the meaning of this psi, and what's the physical meaning of this psi. OK, you can compute eigenvalues, eigenfunctions, energy levels, this sort of thing. But what is the role of psi? Is it just a ghost? that uh, comes in, help, solves the problem and goes away, has no physical meaning, or is it really there is something there? So at least in this sense, it, it's very concrete, has very concrete physical meaning. Nothing like that in this case, because if you form this psi star psi, I mean psi bar psi, this is not preserved under, under, uh, under the flow, under this, whatever the flow might be. Um, what is preserved is that if you do something similar to that, but with respect to uh, this quadratic form, one minus one minus one minus one. But that quantity is not a probability distribution. It can be both negative and positive. So he had difficulty accepting this because of these two reasons uh, as a, um, as a um, physically viable uh, kind of equation as, as, as a useful equation. Now, okay, so he rejected this, and in response, he discovered something wonderful, much more wonderful, much more amazing than this. But it turned out later on that actually this equation is not such a bad thing after all. <laughs> this equation was found applications in, in, in describing pions and some other, some, some nuclear physics people, uh, found applications uh, for, for this equation. So this equation is not totally, as, as we are arguing here against it, it's not totally on physical either. I mean, it has its own physical application, but okay, we have to go into a sort of different type of stories to, to recall. Yeah. So in the Schroeder equation, we could mm -hmm. introduce potential for our uh, uh, potential. There's a potential, right. And we also do that in the fine board. Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Uh, yes, I mean, here, this is in fact a free space. So this is a free um, uh, particle here. Yeah. Um, I really don't know, but I suppose it should be possible, but I, I, I really don't know. That, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, this is, this is free particles. Uh, I mean, non interacting, just free, just one particle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we will have a sort of plain wave solutions only in this case. Yeah, that's right. But, but in, the case, in this case, there is a potential which really captures forces in physics. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know, but I suppose we can, we can add. But I haven't seen this. Uh, this is a very important equation also for, for PDE. I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's not a wave equation except when m is equal to zero. If m is equal to zero, it is the wave equation. It's a very well-known equation, has been studied before, but with m non-zero, it's, uh, it's a different. So we have to also uh, worry about uh, m being zero or non-zero uh, all the time. It has some, some implications uh, for the problem. Anyhow, so that was the problem uh, that uh, Dirac um, wanted to solve. And it's, it's, uh, it's, there's a story that he met uh, Bohr, Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, I think in early, sometime in 1927. And Bohr, uh, because he was already quite well known because of his two, two papers he wrote before on quantum mechanics. So Bohr asked him uh, what you're doing. He said that I'm thinking about an equation for electron. Bohr uh, told him that, but there is Carl Golden equation. Why are you wasting your time? He said, no, I don't, I don't think that's the wrong equation. I don't know how the discussion went after that, but uh, Dirac went on and kept thinking about it, and uh, 
eventually found something amazing that we are going to discuss. So he found the Iraq equation. Um, so let me now um, uh, tell you how he came across the equation. So his reasoning is actually fairly natural. I mean, um, seems like naive at first, but amazing. So if you are, excuse me. I'm still uh, describing this 1927 paper. So he said that, okay, you have this Klein-Gordon equation or operator D2, D2 minus Laplacian plus M2. That's, a, that's, a, that's an operator, right? And we are looking for first order differential equations for electron. So they should be first order in T and first order in ddx to divide it, I mean in x, y, z. So he said that, okay, we can just take this and decompose this equation, uh, factorize this equation, because that's what complex numbers are for. So you can just write it as, um, okay, so you, you can write it in different form, for example, i d d t uh, plus h, times i minus i dt minus h, so actually plus h. Uh, so this we call uh, h if you want. Minus Laplacian plus m squared, let's call, call it h. So, well, I mean, uh, that's, that's uh, what it is, right? So we just write it like that. Uh, now, um, um, okay, so, um, so when H, oh, that's not H, sorry. Well, it is H, but I mean, uh, it's, uh, that's not H, that's uh, H squared, where H, is equal to sums of alpha i, the i, i from one to three, plus a beta m. Uh, so a squared uh, is equal to minus plus, in plus m squared. This equation immediately gives you some relations for this alpha i and beta to satisfy. You square it equal to this operator, which is constant coefficients and then m squared. It comes out to be that you should have beta squared equal to one, or the j squared minus one, alpha i, alpha j plus alpha j alpha i equal to zero i different from j and alpha i or alpha j beta plus uh, beta alpha j equal to zero. You drive this sort of relations. This is exactly the notation. I mean, he used the alphas and beta. In, in the paper. Okay, so you can decompose your operator like that, provided uh, that uh, alphas and beta satisfy these equations. But now you can see that th there are no complex numbers that satisfy these equations because complex numbers, uh, I mean, they always commute the multiplication. So we cannot arrange this, and we cannot arrange that either. So um, no complex number solutions. C number solutions. Uh, 
Um, but at the time of Dirac, there was this uh, Pauli matrices were already used by Pauli uh, to write uh, equation for electron in the presence of uh, magnetic field and to deal with the spin of electrons and this sort of things. So he was aware of existence uh, of uh, some operator, some matrices at least that satisfy relations like this. Um, so his intuition was that there must be matrices that satisfy this equation, perhaps. But perhaps there exist matrices uh, that will do the job. Satisfy these equations. In fact, uh, so to, to do that, uh, so he said, okay, consider, let's recall, uh, Pauli spin matrices, so sigma one is equal to uh, zero, one, one, zero. Sigma two is equal to zero minus i, i zero. And sigma three is equal to one zero zero minus one. Usually, uh, this is also denoted as sigma z. I believe this is sigma y, and this is sigma x. Uh, so there is alternative notation used for these things, but it doesn't matter. If you just use sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Uh, so then he cooked up. Um, but you see, you cannot just use sigma one, sigma two, sigma three because I mean, what is beta then? Well, beta, I mean, uh, there's no solution. So I'll write down the exact statement. But what he did, he said, okay, let them. Um, so his solution was let alpha j equal to zero, sigma j minus sigma j, zero. This is j equal to one, two, three. And beta equal to identity zero, zero minus identity. So these are now four by four matrices. And you easily check that uh, uh, sigma i, sigma j, plus sigma j, sigma i equal to 2 delta i j. These are Pauli spin matrices relations. This is known. This is known. So this immediately implies that, this relation immediately implies that alpha j and beta satisfy the system of equations that uh, you need. Implies that alpha j beta satisfy. So let's call these equations star, maybe. So star. Okay, so then there is an operator. So there exists now. So let D. Be equal to uh, now this operator, um, which is um, um, okay. So let D be equal to uh, psi dt uh, minus uh, i h. So it's d dt minus i h psi. Okay. So this this operator. I mean, just I just write it like this. So, so this is a kind of first version of this Dirac operator. So d psi equal to zero. This is Dirac equation. Um, so 
one thing we should notice is that if because of this, um, so what what did we do? I mean, we just write, uh, we just multiply this by uh, by i, right? Yeah, just multiply it by i, and then uh, and then this equation becomes um, well, i squared minus one i is i. Uh, so if I multiply this by i. Maybe I should take this. I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe I should take this as i plus i. Yeah. So this i equal to zero implies that actually psi is also a solution of the prime order equation. So that's just half of the equation. So I satisfies a D. Um, now, so, so, so the operator now, uh, DDT plus I, IH, uh, now is, is not acting on usual wave function as a result. So it's acting on uh, vector valued wave functions, right? So now, so this D, this operator D, which still is, is not in its final form, is not in its final form, but still is, is exactly equivalent to, to the Dirac operator. So this uh, D now acts uh, on some functions, say C infinity of, for example, R4 and C4. C4 because this, uh, Betas now are uh, alphas and betas are uh, four by four are four, four by four matrices, so they have to act on column four matrices now. Right? So it's acting from here to uh, here. Okay. So now um, you can think of this as sections of a bundle over 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 R four. So this is going to be S uh, to S. So this S we can take uh, as vector bundle to be C4, uh, sorry, R4 plus C4. So this is a trivial bundle. We got rank 4 bundle. Uh, vector bundle over, over R4. Okay, so um, now, what well, remember we started everything by asking for relativistic invariance. Uh, is this so? The question is: Is this relativistic invariant? So, the question is: Is D relativistic invariant? So in this case, uh, you have uh, to also define again what relativistic invariance means, because in the case of a scalar field, the Lorentz group only acted on uh, on the space-time coordinates on the base, and uh, so we, we we saw that uh, the definition is that uh, this. Differential operator, for example, Klein Gordon, is equivalent with respect to action of the Lorentz group on, on, on fields. But here, uh, that definition is not correct because Lorentz group also acts on uh, this uh, C4 on, 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 on the target. So we have to bring that into equations because there is also no natural coordinates in, in, in the target space. Here, when I write C4, it means that I have fixed the coordinate system for this target space. And I'm not allowed to do that. There is no natural coordinate. Any, anytime you introduce coordinate in physics, you are breaking some rules. You have to make sure that everything is invariant on those choices that you have made, right? So in this case, uh, I'm not going in detail right now into this, but uh, so, so we have to look at 
we take action of Lorentz group lambda on C4 as well. So there exists a representation of Lorentz group on C4. So um, representation go on in the more systems of uh, or actually automorphisms of C4. I mean G and C4. See, there are different representations here. There exists a particular representation is called a uh, spin representation, which I'm not writing it. And uh, if you take that representation into account, uh, yeah, okay. So, um, so this is sort of spin representation. I hope this is a spin representation, but I'm not sure. So, what does what does uh, invariance uh, means? Invariance. Well, basically, uh, it, it really means that. Um, When you act on, uh, so what, what does it mean? It means that, so let's define an action of uh, L, Lorentz group on fields. So the action I define is like this lambda of psi at the point x is equal to rho of lambda psi of lambda inverse of x. That's the action. You see, the, the action is like this. You are moving on the base, on the space-time with the space-time coordinates uh, with respect to this uh, Lorentz uh, group. And then also you are moving uh, the field values by this representation. That's a matrix, uh, this particular representation. This, this defines an action. And with respect to this action, we want to say that this operator, for example, Dirac, is equivalent. So that's the thing invariance means that D of psi prime is equal to D of psi again prime. So this is psi prime x. So it's like before, it's like what we had before, except that uh, we have to be careful with the way we, we define this action. So I'm not getting into that, but I tell you that there is an issue here. So we have to be, when you read uh, physics literature, so you have to be aware of that. Okay, so, um, but even for us, for mathematicians, uh, even something, kind of more basic and fundamental than this sort of uh, understanding the relativistic invariance is. Um, how many solutions these equations have? So Dirac gave one solution. Uh, perhaps he even gave, gave se several solutions, but here is one solution. But as a mathematician, you should ask, uh, are there any other solutions? What are all possible solutions? Is this the smallest dimension we can go? Is there a three by three, for example? System of three by three matrices. Because we are working, we are looking for four matrices that satisfy these relations. Are there, I erased the relation, but uh, are there like three by three, um, are there real matrices, for example, that satisfy these equations? All these things are questions, right? So um, let me now um, write down, in this case at least, in this special case, the answer, and then we will now have to prove this to understand. Any question? 
Okay. So now let us. Um, so one of the things uh, we will prove soon is the following result. It will follow from a more general result, but here is the term. Uh, let S be a vector space complex numbers um, and alpha J beta belong to and the morphisms of S. So I'm, I'm assuming dimension of, yeah, okay, so. And the morphisms of S, J equal to one, two, three. So these guys are satisfying uh, relations. Okay, so the relations that I derived before, um, so beta squared equal to one. Alpha j, alpha i, alpha j plus alpha j, alpha i equal to two alpha i j and beta alpha j, alpha i plus alpha i, or I would say j, j beta equal to zero. So this is for all i and j's. Then dimension of S over complex numbers. First of all, we know that is a multiple of four. It's four k. For some k equal to one. So on. Okay, so I should say uh, finite dimensional because it's possible to stack together many copies of this and create infinite dimensional solutions. Uh, but we are not interested in that. So we are interested only in finite matrices, so this would be the case, 4K, K, like that. Uh, S is equal to S1, X sum S1, so there is a decomposition. Is well, this one is the solution that we wrote, is our original solution. And actually, um, any two uh, solutions are similar to each other. So essentially, once you fix the dimension, there exists a unique solution. And any two solutions. So in other words, if you have, um, for a given S, if there are other matrices in that space, uh, four matrices in that space that satisfy these relations. There exists uh, a matrix A such that alpha J prime is equal to A alpha J, the inverse, and beta equal to A uh, beta, the inverse for some A. Belonging to the GL. This is this is the uniqueness of uh, up to obviously you should see if you have a system of solutions and you do this you're going to get another solution so this this is this is free this sort of move is free so there is not absolute uniqueness there is uniqueness up to similarity up to conjugation but then that, that that's true that's true this will prove some uh, also. Okay, so that, that's a kind of convincing solution at least at this, uh, to this problem. I mean, it gives us some, some assurance that this 
I think it should be in line with student. Okay. Double identity. Oh, because you want uh, alpha squared to be minus one. Uh, alpha squared is equal to minus one? Or oh, did, did, did you get alpha squared to be minus one? So. For, for Pauli, uh, what was it? Pauli squared to one. Oh, but this one is minus one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is not, uh, yeah, this is not zero. It's right. Like minus. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the equation that we derived was uh, alpha j squared equal to minus one. Very good. All right, so uh, now uh, these uh, sort of equations like this are kind of, um, they are called uh, Clifford algebra relations. So these relations, so relations like, Or Clifford algebra relations. This was actually studied by Clifford uh, long before Dirac. Um, it's, it's amazing that he <laughs> introduced, for some mathematical reason, um, relations. Um, well, I mean, I know why. I'll tell you. Relations the star are or Clifford algebra relations. Um, and uh, so specifically, they are not even Clifford algebra relations. They are representations of Clifford algebra relations because Clifford algebra relations are just relations. They're, they're not attached to any matrices. They're abstract relations. These are in, instances of that relation, right? So, uh, so I should say our representations are Clifford algebra relations. So, so we have to distinguish between the two. Clifford algebra relations are abstract. I will define them. They're, they're quite abstract, and so this is just relations algebra. These are representations. So there's a big difference between a group and representations of the group. For representations, you have many, many representations, but group is unique. Right? There's, there's one, one group, many, many representations. Same here. Okay, so then what we have to understand is, we have to understand uh, this Clifford algebra and its representation too, in order to have a handle on all possible solutions this problem in this case. So just to, to solve this question and more general questions, you have to understand Clifford algebras and all, all, uh, all of the representation too. Now, why Clifford was uh, interested in this, uh, I, have, I have to look at Clifford's paper, uh, uh, his collected works. But by all chances, he was uh, motivated by extending uh, Hamilton's uh, uh, quaternions. Because when Hamilton discovered quaternions, um, <clears throat> people tried to extend quaternions. So to five by <clears throat> to five dimensional, six dimensional, higher dimensional. Very soon they showed that it's impossible to have uh, all the axioms for a skew field satisfy uh, for a finite dimensional system of equations like uh, like quaternions. So basically real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, that's it. If you fix some conditions, that's it. There, there are no other, there are no other uh, skew fields beyond those. But people said, okay, I don't want skew fields. Maybe we can have other things, uh, other algebra. So they were called hyper-complex numbers. So these hyper-complex numbers uh, were quite important and people studied this thing. Most probably Clifford came from that point of view, but we have to see, I, I will check the paper, this paper, I mean, okay, so this is one thing, um, now uh, we have to also get, get to the basic definition of Clifford algebra now, so I'm going to define it now, so this was the motivation.
So to define Clifford algebras, we need something like quadratic space. Quadratic vector space. Vq. So it consists of two things. Uh, a v, v, v is a vector space over field. Over field K. Uh, okay, you could assume the field K has characteristic different from two if it bothers you. At one place, it may be bothersome to have a field of characteristic two, have to do some special things, but let's assume it's characteristic not two, that's okay. And Q uh, from V to uh, K is a quadratic form. On B. Uh, alternatively, we can just say we have a symmetric bilinear form on B. Symmetric bilinear form. On B. Uh, so th they are the same. So if you have a symmetric bilinear form, you can define, you see, you can go from this gadget to this gadget by the following rule Q of X is equal to linear product of X and X in itself. From Q also, you can go and construct this. Uh, so this would be polarization identity, right? So this would be like XY. equal to one half, I would say Q of X plus Y minus Q X minus Q Y. So you see, I need half. So that's why I said uh, characteristic two. <laughs> so these spaces uh, are, are important vector spaces. They are quadratic spaces exactly because they have this quadratic form or equivalently they have this symmetric bilinear form. Now, the symmetric bile in the form need not be, uh, I mean, even if, if you're R over R, need not be positive definite, okay? So it can be, can have signature. And also, it can be completely equal to zero. No, no, I didn't say anything about it being non-degenerate. Uh, so let me say right away, eg q equal to zero, this is okay. Anyhow, so we have this, um, uh, we have this quadratic uh, space, vector spaces. Now, these quadratic vector spaces have uh, Clifford algebras. So I'm going to define this. So definition, uh, Clifford algebra. For quadratic space B and Q is an associative unital algebra. Yeah, so associative unital algebra A uh, with a map. Row, say I could just call it row right now. Maybe we should call it I, I'm not sure. Maybe I from V into A such that um, uh, such that um, yeah, Q of X is equal to um Oh, sorry, such that x squared, <laughs> okay, i of x squared 
is equal to negative q of x times two. You see, this is an equation in A. This is in, in A. For any x in B, right? For any x in B, we have this equation. And this map is universal. And I is universal, such map. So being universal, it means that if you have any other uh, A, so this is B, A, so this is I, this is I prime. If you have any other algebra A prime and a map I prime, uh, so map I prime into A prime that satisfies this relation, there exists a unique algebra map Here, such that, so if this is maybe rho, such that i prime is equal to rho composed with i. This is, a, this is a universal property of such maps. So basically what it says is that you can turn V into an algebra by adding products of elements from V in, in, in any way, which way you want. Uh, such that basically you're taking square roots. <laughs> so uh, this quadratic form Q times one has a square root inside the algebra. So, you, so, so, so you're taking square roots of uh, these elements. Uh, so this is related to the original Dirac Laplacian relationship, right? So we had Dirac wanted essentially, if imagine if M if m was equal to zero, what Dirac said is that take the square root of the Laplacian, that's all. Well, Laplacian was not quite Laplacian, it was, was D'Alembert, it was a Laplacian for that Minkowski metric, but otherwise, so there was that just m that complicated things, the master, otherwise it was just uh, you're taking square root of the Laplacian. So that's good, uh, that's the definition, and uh, that's the universal property, so that's, uh, End of the definition. So now, um, what is true is that such a thing exists. Um, so let on. Okay. So uh, just just a note is that if A exists, then it is um, unique up to unique isomorphism by universal property. By universal property. If uh, A exists, then it is unique uh, up to a unique isomorphism. This is always universal properties have this property by up to a unique isomorphism. That's, that's okay. So all we have to show, uh, we, have, we have to see is if uh, the Clifford algebra exists or not, and it does. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this definition. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this lecture. So, so let's prove that this exists. And that's the result. So lemma. A, which we denote as cliff of B, I mean, you should write it as cliff of B and Q. Uh, so, but sometimes you just write cliff of B, but that's okay. Cliff of B and Q exists. Proof. Okay, 
Sorry about that. Right. So how we're going to prove this? Well, okay, so let's take the tensor algebra. TB equal to K dx sum B, dx sum B tensor B, dx sum B tensor 3. So this is the tensor algebra of B. It's an algebra. Uh, so we define a two sided idea here. Let I be the two sided ideal. ideal generated by um, elements like this. Uh, uh, X tensor X um, plus QX times one for such elements for all X in B. So then uh, let us define A to be equal to the quotient of this tensor algebra by this two sided diagram. So we just take TV divided by I. Then it's very easy to see that. Uh, so let's define this map I to be so we have this inclusion V inside TV, and then we have this map from TV to I. So let I be this map. This is composition. So this is the algebra. This is an algebra map. The first one is a linear map, and that's so this is A. And you can check that this satisfies. So this fits the bill. Okay, very good. So, um, okay, so just make one comment about this. So let me give you one example of this, the simplest example. Of course, the simplest example is when Q is equal to zero. It's just, that's, that's a bona fide example. We should, we should treat that uh, for Q equal to zero. This A, in this case, what we are doing, uh, we are defining by squares of elements. So by this polarization, it means that in this algebra, x, y is equal to minus y, x. So that's Grassmann algebra. So a is equal to Grassmann algebra. A dx on b, dx on b h b. This is the famous Grassmann algebra that also used in definition of differential forms and all those things. So, so, so Grassmann algebra is an instance of uh, our general construction of Clifford algebra. That's, that's important to realize. So that's one point. Second point is that Dimension of this space, if, if this, we didn't say anything about dimension of V, I and mean, this construction is general, it's true in general. But if dimension of V is N, V over K is equal to N. 
then uh, you immediately compute the dimension of its Clifford algebra. For any q is always two to the n. So this dimension is always two to the n. Um, to check this is not difficult. I mean, um, so kind of proof, a quick uh, sketch is this. Pick a basis. And B. Uh, then, uh, first of all, you see that, um, of course, you see uh, EI EJ plus EJ EI. Um, yeah, you see, um, we can uh, write a relation. Um, like this. So, so let me let me um, tell you. First of all, what is e i squared? E i squared is minus q of e i, right? By by, by our, our universal property minus q of e i um, one. You see this map i from b to Clifford algebra. I just denote it by, you know, I don't distinguish now in this image of this map. So, so I just I just say it takes x to x. In fact, you can use the universal property to make sure that this is, a, this is an injective map. You have to prove this, but that's not difficult. It's injective. So I can forget about i. I just use uh, this. And um, so that's true, uh, but uh, look, I mean, uh, Q of, you see, E i, so let me write it like this. Uh, imagine we want to do E i plus E j, I plus E j, right? This we know that this is equal to minus Q of E i plus E j. So it's a number times one minus Q of E i plus E j times one. But if you expand it, you're going to get um, E i E j the product of, um, uh, no, not that. Actually, I'm just multiplying these things together. Sorry. Okay, so let me, yeah, that's better. This video. That's better. Okay, so now I can write as EI squared plus EI EJ plus EJ EI plus EJ squared. So it gives me that this is equal to minus Q of EI plus EJ one. Now if you look at it, by this observation, this is a multiple of one. This is a multiple of one. So this is a multiple of one. So EI EJ plus EJ EI is a central element, commutes with everything, right? So EI EJ plus EJ EI is central. So you can you can write it so some some multiple of one. I don't care what that what that thing is. So Anytime you multiply elements, you can switch the order of EI and J by creating a one which commutes with everything. So this immediately implies that you don't need more than just uh, this many elements. Okay. So it follows that uh, all elements in in um, cliff or linear combinations of these elements uh, EI, EI, EJ, or I less than J, EI, EJ, EK, for I less than J, less than K, 
Because any other order you can switch, you can put it in increasing order. And if the, the two things, two labels, adjacent labels are the same, you know that it's a multiple of identity, so drops from the product. So it means that dimension of this Clifford algebra is at most two to the n. This one, over k is less than equal to 2 to the n. Then you have to go on and show that the dimension is actually 2 to the n to show that these elements are linear independent, really. That's not difficult, but it needs a proof, and you have to spend some time thinking about it, which is useful. Um, Okay, so we've got um, just very basic definitions so far of Clifford algebras. Um, okay, so So now um, we can use um, Clifford algebras to construct uh, square roots of Laplacians now. So, so let's uh, take, so I'm going to finish soon, so let me just take, introduce a concept, the Clifford module. So let, let me give you a um, uh, kind of, So, so assume uh, K go to R and um, um, this guy is positive definite. Positive definite, right? So this is a so this is a Euclidean. This quadratic space is a Euclidean space in this case, right? So Euclidean space, right? So we've got a Euclidean space. Uh, so in this case, then I know that I can pick a system of orthonormal bases. This orthonormal basis that. Basis B, and then uh, these elements satisfy uh, in the group of the algebra E i E j plus E j E i is equal to negative two delta i j. In the group of algebra, they satisfy these relations. So these relations also we can say these are. For the algebra relations, so this is kind of nice because you can just think about it, and then uh, it's very concrete. And you don't have to go to tensor algebra or anything. It's just an algebra generated by elements in one here that satisfy these two conditions. Okay, so that's one thing. Now. You can also have more, uh, so the second example could be something like this. Again, k is equal to r, but your uh, form may not be positive definite. You could have some positive and some negative things, right? Um, say, in general, for any non-degenerate form, say, symmetric body in the form. Uh, so there is a result due to, um, well, I mean, there's a basic result about quadratic form that tells you that there exists always a basis which is of this form, uh, E1, uh, EI, 
when you go to one, I less than equal to p given one, and e i squared is equal to minus one, right? Uh, for i bigger than p plus one, less than equal to p plus q. So n is equal to p plus q. And of course, uh, you know, e i e j plus e j e i equal to zero. Uh, for i different function. This is also, these are also a, a classes uh, of Clifford algebra that are important. I mean, this, this class is important I mean, uh, because the representation theory depends on this index. So, on P and N. So, in the complex numbers, uh, you can always multiply by i, and it's always the i squared equal to one. In the case of complex numbers, things become very simple. Very, very simple. Okay, so maybe just uh, for fun, let's look at one example of this. Um, what happens in this case for n equal to one, for example, what is this Clifford algebra in this case? So we are talking about this case now. The dimension of your vector space is one. So what is clear in this case? Okay, so we are adding, what we are doing? We are adding one element, right? E1, e, which is the basis of B or E, and square is minus one, and it commutes with one. So this is complex numbers. So uh, this is isomorphic to C, uh, as real algebras. That's cool. So what is uh, n equal to two case? In the n equal to two case, uh, what will be dimension of this guy? Dimension of cliff will be four. And we have uh, these basis elements, one, e one, e two, uh, then we have got uh, E1, E2, right? Okay, E1 squared is one, minus one, sorry. E2 squared is minus one. What is E1, E2 squared, for example? Well, this is E1, E2 times E1, E2. Okay, we can switch once. We get E1, E2 with minus one. Minus one, so this is also minus one. So we have got uh, these elements squared to minus one. All these elements, these three elements are squared to minus one. They, um, they, um, this guy is anti commute, and I believe this and that also anti commute uh, because you've got uh, E2, E1 switch, and then wait a minute, so E2 times E1, E2. What is that? That's equal to minus E1, E2, and then uh, E2. E2 squared is minus 1. What am I doing? I'm, I'm making a mistake. I just want to check if this is equal to um, minus E1, E2. It is. It is? Yeah, they're both equal to E1. 
or the rows equal to E1. Oh, cool. Yeah. So E2, E1 is minus E1, E2. E2. This is E1. And this one is also E1. Cool. So, yes. Um, okay. So I'm willing to accept that this is coterminous. So uh, this is isomorphic to uh, is it coterminous rotation was it H coterminous? I mean this is not a proof yet. Uh, this is just an indication of that coterminous. Um, so. Um, what else we have to do? Oh, I mean, we have to at least give a map because quaternions is one IJK basis with that rule. So could it be that this is maybe E1, E2, this is E1, E2? Does it work? The map that sends 1 to 1, it has to go with the unit. E1 to I, E2 to J, E1, E2 to K, it's, uh, it's an algebra isomorphism between quaternions and this. So uh, Clifford, uh, Clifford uh, things, uh, so uh, as real algebra. Of course, quaternions is not even a complex algebra, so uh, it's not algebra over complex numbers. <laughs> so that's not obvious, but that's more or less good. Okay, so we have that. And it's kind of fun to go through the list and find uh, the third one. So what is Cliff, for example? Now that you're doing this kind of fun game. So what is Cliff? Uh, um, so here. N equal to three. Again, positive definite. So Cliff in this case, dimension over R of Cliff D is two to the three, which is eight. Okay, now we have to know what kind of algebra is that. Um, um, my guess is that this is uh, two copies of quaternions. But I don't know. <laughs> so maybe it is just, uh, so let's write it. Could it be that this is this one? So what, what does it mean to prove this? We have to find um, two parts here that, uh, that these two parts commute with each other. So we have to decompose this as algebra that also commute with each other. And I believe uh, this E1, E2, and this sort of thing can help us, but let's see, maybe just spend a few minutes before we go to, because this is kind of fun now, so. So base is going to be one, E1, E2, E3, and then you got E1, E2, uh, E1, E3, E2, E3. And then we have got E1, E2, E3. And then, um, oh, do I, am I okay? Yeah, E1, E2, yeah, I guess so, right? No, 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 no I made a mistake. Uh, one, E1, E2, E3, E1, E2, E1, E2, E2, E3. Sorry? I think it's one. Is it okay? Yeah. But I, I need eight elements. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, very good. So we have eight elements. So now let's try something like this. Now. Let's try um, then uh, one, E1, E2, and E1, E2. Because this, we know that it creates one copy of uh, quaternions, at least, right? One copy of, co copy of quaternions. So this generates H. Let's take for the other one, but I need a unit now. Okay, that's okay. 
Well, I don't have any other choice but taking E1, E2. No, E1, E2, I've already used. E1, E3, E2, E3. Oh, I need eight. What happened? Oh, E3. I need, okay, so I just choose, yes, 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 E3. And then uh, E1, E3. Oh, yes. E1, E3. E2, E3, E1, E2, E3. Do they form a subalgebra at all? No. E3 times E1, E3 and makes E1. It's out of it, huh? Yeah. So that's not subalgebra. I think this might be um, two by two point. Yeah. Yeah, there's split quaternions. Sorry? There are uh, split quaternions, right? There are two copies of quaternions? Is that right? Uh, I think they're, they're called split quaternions. I, I don't know if it's a different structure or not. But... So what is split quaternions? Um, I guess it's like H tensor uh, CL1 or something like this. Or H tensor CL1, what is that? Uh, CL, CL uh, minus one, I guess. So with the oh. uh, opposite metric, I guess. Oh, with the opposite metric, right. Ah, so is it H direct sum H? It can be, it's isomorphic, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, isomorphism. But I mean, uh, look things that, so there is another, so what are, uh, what are real eight dimensional algebras? <laughs> How many? Eight dimensional real algebras we know. Well, there is another one which is M2 of C, D. Dimension of this guy is equal to eight dimension over R of H to X on H and is also equal to eight. We know that it should not be commutative, so I cannot take R to X on R to X on R eight times. Or it's not. Um, so maybe, I don't know, but I mean, first of all, I don't know if there are any others, and so what are, what are the other solutions, So, <laughs> um, I think that's a good point to start because we have reached the point that you can think about some issues now. So that's, that's a good, good point to start. And we are just thinking about Clifford algebras for positive definite, positive definite forms and uh, um, They are all known, by the way. They're all known. And there is an eightfold uh, uh, periodicity in this Clifford algebra. But okay, but this we have to prove, at least give the maps. Um, okay, so we can, we can, we can just uh, stop now and then talk about it later. So that's a good point to stop. So. Okay, so let's pause, okay.